Well, last time we began what is popularly known as the passion narrative, which essentially dominates the remaining chapters of Matthew's gospel. Now, the circumstances of leading up to Christ's execution and his burial, his resurrection, the immediate aftermath, represents probably the most focused upon portion of all the synoptic gospel writers. Yet it's not without its controversies. And those controversies are anything but trivial. Immediately upon opening Matthew chapter 26, in verse 2, we read this statement that seems to be so straightforward, yet it's anything but. Matthew 26, 2 says, As you know, Pesach, Passover, is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be nailed to the execution stake. Now, the controversial issue is that this verse opens with that it is not Yeshua predicting his crucifixion. That's not the big deal. It is the mention of Passover, Pesach, being two days away as a prelude to what we're soon going to be reading about. And while the two days away comment is repeated in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, Mark strangely interjects that Passover is also called the Feast of Matzah. Now, the Gospels of Luke and John make no mention of the exact time frame, only saying that Passover was near. Luke makes it clear, however, that for him, he took took it that the terms Passover and unleavened bread were interchangeable. Now, this is no small matter. Because the Torah establishes the feast of Passover and unleavened bread as separately ordained feasts, each with their own significance, different requirements, different lakes of time of observance. Then, even though the next feast in the series of the three springtime Torah ordained festivals called First Fruits is not mentioned, The timing of first fruits is established in relation to the observance of Passover and unleavened bread. Now, this reality is weighty, see, because the Messiah is some years later, said by the Apostle Paul, to be the first fruits of the resurrection. Now, it's obvious to me that Paul concluded that Christ arising from the grave on the Feast of First Fruits, Bichrim in Hebrew, was no coincidence. Rather, it was symbolic of the general resurrection that would eventually come as prophesied by Israel's prophets of old. Now, the nearly universal Christian doctrine on the matter is that Christ died on Passover day, went into the grave just at the beginning of that evening, and then arose on Sunday. Using a Hebrew calendar and the Torah as our guide, then it means that he died on Passover day, he went into the grave moments before the beginning of the Feast of Matzah, because when Passover ends, The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Matzah, begins immediately. Then he arose from the grave around sunrise on the first day of the week, about 72 hours later, on what we call Sunday. However, the reality is that the Christian timeline defies the Hebrew traditions of that era, as well as the age-old calendar of God-ordained biblical feast days that the Jews commemorated and were commanded to observe, and they did. 
The Christian timeline also takes into no account the crucial reality that biblically a day doesn't begin at midnight as it does in modern times, or does it begin at daybreak? Biblically, and the way the Jews observed it, a new day begins at sunset. So last week, we began the complicated exploration of this matter. We'll continue it today, which also involves the Last Supper, something we haven't encountered yet, that is said to occur the night before Christ died. The Last Supper is said by traditional Christianity to have been the Passover meal or Seder. Yet that cannot be the case because it's on Passover day that the Passover lambs are slaughtered and cooked and then eaten just after sunset. So if he died on Passover at about the time the Passover lambs were being slaughtered, how could the Last Supper have been the Passover meal if the lambs had yet to be killed and cooked? You following me on that? Thus, as I have characterized it on numerous occasions, this entire matter can be appropriately called a can of worms because it is so complex, because there are some differences among the gospel accounts about the timing that does seem to conflict. Or, as I prefer to think, it is not that the accounts conflict. Rather, it has to do with the use of different terminology. Terminology that has been misinterpreted by Gentile Bible translators because of a lack of understanding of the Jewish world in that era in general and of the biblical Torah in specific. Now, I'm not going to review the information that I gave you last time on this subject, but I am going to add to it. The way the Hebrew calendar worked, beginning in Moses' era, and it continued through Christ's era, it continues to this very day, is that Passover is a date on the calendar. In the civil Hebrew calendar, Passover occurs in the seventh month of the year that is called Nisan, or also known as um, Aviv. It's two different names for the same month. In the Hebrew religious observance calendar, Nisan is the first month of the year. The one-day biblical feast of Passover, Pesach, occurs always on the 14th of Nisan. Therefore, it can occur on any day of the week that the 14th of Nisan happens to fall on in any given year. The seven-day feast of unleavened bread, of matzah, begins on the 15th of the month of Nisan, so obviously it too can fall on any day of the week coming immediately after Passover. So, if in a particular year, Nisan 14 falls on a Monday, then the Unleavened Bread Festival begins on Tuesday. If in another year, Nisan 14, Passover falls on a Wednesday, then the Unleavened Bread Feast begins on Thursday. So on. This is not hard to grasp. (laughs) But the other commandments concerning these feasts are where it begins to get more complicated. Now, Passover is biblically a feast day, but in all other respects, it's just a regular day. That is, a person can do work on that day if they choose to. And further, they have no obligation to make a journey to the temple for the Feast of Passover. It's not a commandment to do that. All that is to happen on Passover is that each family is to slaughter a lamb and cook it, then wait until after sunset to eat it. In fact, 
when we look closely in most respects, Passover was originally intended to be a feast that was celebrated in one's own home as a family because that's how it happened when they were in Egypt. That is, Passover is a remembrance of that event in Egypt when God killed all the Egyptian firstborn and it resulted in the release of Israel to go to their promised land. In Egypt, each Israelite family was instructed to slaughter and cook a lamb. Its blood was painted on the doorposts of one's homes, and then after sunset, that lamb was eaten. A couple of hours later, God's wrath of death flowed out, flowed through Egypt, and killed all the firstborn males of every household, bypassing all those homes where the blood of the lamb had been painted on their doorposts. This event so devastated Pharaoh that he ordered Israel to leave Egypt. The next morning, the Israelites hurried to pack up and leave, but because bread was their staple food, but the preparation of bread that included a few hours for it to, to rise before baking, that wouldn't work because they had to leave so quickly then the Israelites had to prepare bread that didn't include the agent that makes it rise, yeast, leaven. Thus, when a few weeks later at Mount Sinai, God gave later, uh, God gave rather a Moses the Torah, part of it included instructions to commemorate this event annually for all time by the creation of the biblical feasts of Passover and unleavened bread. Now, the feast of Passover, a feast rather of unleavened bread, unlike Passover, did require a trip to the temple in Jerusalem where certain sacrifices were to occur. But the key, the key to understanding the biblical timeline of these feast days is this. In addition to the requirement of the Israelites being present at the temple in Jerusalem for the entire seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first and the last days of this feast were set apart as special Sabbaths. This is not the weekly seventh-day Sabbath we're talking about. Rather, this is two special feast Sabbaths that are added. Nonetheless, like the seventh-day Sabbath, on these special added feasts, no work was to be done. Nonetheless, if travel to Jerusalem was required, that is, one wasn't a local resident of Jerusalem, the journey had to conclude before the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, since travel was not allowed on a Sabbath. Therefore, it was typical that since Passover was the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, people that traveled, which represented most Jews, made sure they were in Jerusalem in time to also celebrate Passover there. It was simply a matter of practicality. There was no way to be at home, kill and cook the lamb on Passover, pack up and transport your family and the lamb and all the makings for the meal to Jerusalem and then get there before nightfall, all on the same day. So nearly without fail, those who came by decree of the Torah to be at the temple for the Feast of Unleavened Bread came a few days earlier which is just as Jesus and his disciples did, so that they could find lodging, so that they could obtain whatever provisions they needed to celebrate these two feasts before they started. So these two special Sabbath days that are part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread are in Greek, 
called Sabaton and are variously translated into English by saying Sabbath or Great Sabbath, sometimes High Sabbath. Now, translating Sabaton to Sabbath, however, can confuse these special feast days with the regular Seventh-day Sabbath. So translating it to something like Great Sabbath helps us to understand this is a special, but it's a different kind of Sabbath that has mostly the same rules of the Seventh-day Sabbath. However, these Great Sabbaths are associated with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So, it goes like this. Passover on the uh, 14th of Nisan is mostly a regular day, with the exception when it's to kill and cook a lamb. At sunset, Passover ends. This is because the day of the 14th ends. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins because that same sunset starts the day of the 15th. In the next couple of hours after sunset, the Hebrews, the Jews, would have their Passover meal with the centerpiece being that cooked lamb. I'll say it another way. On Passover, the lamb is killed and cooked. At the beginning of unleavened bread, it's eaten. But the real key is to understand that this new day that begins at sunset, begins this on the 15th, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is also a great Sabbath. All work must cease. All travel must cease. Therefore, the day before the great Sabbath, the day of the Feast of Passover, garnered a nickname, Preparation Day. Why? Because all the preparations for the Passover meal took place then and had to be completed before sunset on this on 14th, at which time the next day began, and the next day was a special Sabbath day to begin the Feast of Matzah. Once more, it can confuse us. Even though it's casually called the Passover meal or the Passover Seder with the lamb as the main dish, it's not actually eaten on Passover. It's, eaten, it's only prepared on Passover. It's eaten during the first hours of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, I mentioned this in the previous lesson, but it bears repeating. Just as in the Western world, we have all sorts of nicknames and terms for the days surrounding Christmas and New Year, terms such as the Christmas season, the holiday season, the holidays, Christmas Eve, a few more. We are familiar enough with their meaning and intent to understand all of these terms is used in a conversation. We're not confused because these terms are not meant in their most technical sense. That is, technically, Christmas is a one-day event on December the 25th, and New Year is a one-day event on January 1st. It was the same concerning the festivals of Passover and unleavened bread in Christ's era. Because of the logistics involved, the two feasts would usually be conflated into one term in casual conversation among Jews. Passover regularly meant both of the feasts, and equally, unleavened bread also might mean both of those feasts. Yet the Jews fully understood one another when the conversation might switch from the, those casual terms to the more technical meaning. This is also challenging for us 
because most believers are not familiar with how the biblical feast days work. But it is also especially challenging because we use a modern version of the Roman calendar. And while the Bible defines days as beginning and ending at sunset, we go by a mechanical clock whereby days are defined as beginning and ending at 12 midnight. So every biblical, every Hebrew calendar day winds up spanning parts of two Roman calendar days, our calendar days. Because when a calendar day begins and ends is different for a Roman calendar day versus a Hebrew calendar day. And as we go forward now in Yeshua's march to the cross as recorded in the Gospels and everything that surrounds it, we must keep these facts in mind. And these are facts. They are not speculations. It affects exactly when and what the Last Supper was. It affects whether Christ was killed on Passover day or he was killed on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It affects on what day he went into the grave, and it affects whether the Sabbath, the Bible says the Jews were in a hurry to get Christ down from the cross and buried before this Sabbath began, was a great Sabbath, a special feast day Sabbath, or it was the regular seventh day Sabbath. And then since he definitely arose on the first day of the week, what we call Sunday, did he actually remain in the tomb three days and three, na- three nights as the sign of Jonah, which Yeshua prophesied he would, or was he there a lesser amount of time? Now, we're going to use this information I gave you last week and today as we go along in Matthew and as we encounter this series of various events like the Last Supper as the basis for understanding what occurred, when it occurred, why it occurred, as it did, as it encompasses Messiah's death and his resurrection. Okay. Now, I know you've all got this down. Let's move on now to Matthew chapter 26, verse 3. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're just going to read a portion of it. Matthew chapter 26. We're just going to read the first 13 verses. When Yeshua had finished speaking, he said to his Talmudim, his disciples, As you know, Pesach is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be nailed to the execution stake. Then the head Kohanim, the head priest, and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of Caiaphas, uh, Caiaphas the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest. They made plans to arrest Yeshua Seretip surreptitiously and have him put to death. But they said, not during the festival, or the people will riot. Now, Yeshua was, was in Beit Anya, Bethany, at the home of Shimon, Simon, the man who had Sarat, a woman who had an alabaster jar filled with very expensive perfume, approached Yeshua while he was eating and began pouring it on his head. And when the disciples saw it, they became angry. Why why this waste, they asked. This could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. But Yeshua, aware of what was going on, said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you will not always have me. She poured this perfume on me, to prepare my body for burial. Yes, I tell you that throughout the whole world, wherever this good news is proclaimed, 
what she has done will be told in her memory. Now, there are two events that are being described in what we just read. First, the conspiracy of the temple authorities to get rid of Yeshua. And second, the anointing of him by the woman in Bethany. And, and do not misconstrue what I mean by anointing, which just means to pour out something. I want to create a little background to help us understand what the true motive of the Jewish religious authorities was for this determined drive to do away with this troublesome, troublesome Galilean man. And while it was the temple authorities, the Sadducees, that seemed to be leading this effort to kill Jesus, we also have mention of the scribes and the elders. Now, the scribes and the elders were the religious leaders associated not with the temple, but rather with the synagogue. Likely, however, these synagogue leaders were also associated with the judicial branch of Judaism in that era, the Sanhedrin, which was made up of a group of men from both the temple and the synagogue authorities. Matthew makes it clear that the highest leaders of the Jewish religion wanted this holy man from rural Galilee dead. But why? Why? It was primarily for a political purpose. Even though these leaders would use their religion as the means to spin matters to accomplish their evil intent. Now, the Sadducees, they were the highest temple authorities, and generally speaking, they were hated by the common Jews because the Sadducee aristocrats were all too happy to work with the Romans. The local Roman authorities had no interest in the Jewish religion, nor did they have anything against it. The local authorities, all they wanted was peace in that region. Peace. They wanted also for the Jews to pay their taxes and to find some way to convince the Jewish population to honor Caesar, as was required of everyone in their vast empire. It was mandatory that all people of the empire worshipped Caesar as a god, but the Jews refused. And for a long while, there was much bloodshed. Now, interestingly enough, in time, Rome decided it was better to switch than fight. And they made an exception for the Jews in this regard. Therefore, all they demanded from the Jews was proper respect for Roman law and Caesar as their sovereign. They did not have to worship Caesar as a god. Anything, the main thing that the Romans demanded was for the Jews to obey Roman law, but really only to a point. Accommodations were made when Jewish law and Roman law collided in some cases not in others. For instance, even though the Sanhedrin could order the death sentence for a Jew found guilty of breaking a religious law, they couldn't carry out the sentence unless the local Roman governor officially agreed to it. Apparently that didn't happen very often. Rather, the Romans were more interested in spending their time executing those Jews who broke Roman laws. And in this matter, the temple, temple leadership had little power other than to appeal it. In Yeshua's era, the major issue for the Romans was to identify potential Jewish rebels and troublemakers. 
and then deal with them. And always in the most gruesome, the most public way, way possible, crucifixion. Generally speaking, the temple authorities had little interest in stopping this atrocity against their own people because it did not threaten or enhance their power base or their wealth. And this is critical. The head of the temple authority in that era, the high priest, was always an aristocrat and never of the proper line of Levite priests as commanded in the law of Moses to be the high priest. Quite literally, the high priest was not only illegitimate in that respect, but also he occupied an office that was bought and sold, and usually with the support and blessings of the local Roman governor. It was really a political office. It only masqueraded as a religious office. And its, pers- its purpose was personal profit and power. All of this background to explain that we must not become distracted by the false accusations against Jesus of blasphemy and of insurrection as the supposed reasons that the high priest wanted him dead. The concern was one that every politician worries about a rival coming along and taking the focus off of them. A person that wins the affection of the people, thereby threatening the politicians' hold on them. Further, the temple authorities were charged by Rome with keeping the peace. So the blame for Jewish riots and uprisings always landed on the desk of the high priest. If he could not control the Jewish people, the Romans would facilitate his ouster and get another high priest who would do a better job of it for them. Therefore, the temple authorities, while perhaps making a public show of outrage, were behind the scenes perfectly fine with Roman soldiers threatening, beating, injuring, even killing those Jews that they suspected of as being fomenters of unrest because, in the end, it served their purposes. Now, as good politicians, their decision to kill Christ was never in doubt. It was only how and when. Now, here in Matthew, it's Caiaphas that is identified as the high priest. And it was in his palatial home that the conspirators met. They agreed that they needed to be quite careful about how they went about this, but killing him was the goal. Now, this might be a good time to note that Caiaphas is not mentioned in the Gospels of Mark or Luke, but he is mentioned by name a few times in John's Gospel. I continue to maintain my belief that the writers of Mark and Luke were Gentiles. And so some of the nuances of Jewish society that would matter to Jews, like who the high priest was at the time, aren't so prevalent in their Gospels because it didn't particularly matter to them. Matthew and John, however, were these were written by believing Jews. So facts such as who occupied the high priesthood were important to them. There are also extra-biblical records of Caiaphas identified as the high priest at this time. And Josephus provides one of those reliable records. Now, I highly recommend you get some of the works of Josephus as a wonderful biblical study aid for your library. And as a good start, specifically try to obtain Carta's Illustrated The Jewish War. Great book. And one place you can find it online is at holylandmarketplace.com. It's a beautiful book. Lots of colorful maps. 
and it's going to give you some additional context, needed context, for what was happening in the first century in the Holy Land from an eyewitness. Now, verse 5 makes clear the political sensitivities that the conspirators were trying to navigate. It was, after all, the festival period. Jerusalem and its suburbs were swelled by tenfold their normal size. During those feast days, hundreds of thousands of Jewish pilgrims descending from all over the continent, even from North Africa. Religious zeal ran high, creating a powder keg of emotions. And something like the murder of this beloved holy man, whose name was now well known, could spark riots and unrest, which in turn would get these Jewish religious leaders into hot water with the local Roman governor, Pilate. Let's be clear who these rioters would be. Likely not the immediate residents of Jerusalem, unless they were part of the zealot party. It would be mostly Galileans who had traveled a two, day, two days journey to get there since Yeshua was one of their own. The Judeans had little use for Jesus. Although to be sure, some of them would have sided with him. It's within this backdrop that we find Christ and some of his disciples venturing to nearby Bethany, a, a Jerusalem village suburb, and the story of him being anointed with this with uh, expensive perfume occurs. Now we're told they went to the home of a man named Shimon, and he is further identified as the man who had Surat. Now nearly every English Bible instead assumes that disease he had was leprosy because that's essentially how the Greek is written. The Greek is lepros. But what the Jewish Matthew is describing is not the horribly disfiguring disease of leprosy. The Bible has no interest in such things because fundamentally the Bible is all about spiritual matters, what we could loosely call theology. The reason that the disease is even mentioned by name, or really by kind, is because it is a disease that is brought on by an impure spiritual condition. Surat is not a specific disease. Rather, it's a class of diseases that God is said to bring upon people as an outward revelation of their inward spiritual condition. Now, generally speaking, these people were outcasts. They were isolated outside of cities and villages because such impurity could be spread and the people greatly feared it. Why in this case, Shimon seems to be, still be living in his own home while being afflicted with the, such a disease, I'm not sure. And therefore, I think we have to reconsider what's actually being said. It seems to me that what we are reading is not to be taken as Simon who currently has Surat, but rather as Simon the man who had Surat in the past. That is, he became known in the area for having had it at one time, but no more. Shimon was such a common name in that era that some other means of knowing which Shimon was being referred to, well, that was needed. So saying the Shimon who had Surat was a way to do that and thus to identify whose house Yeshua and his disciples went to. However, whose house they went to is probably not not the real issue, but rather what we're meant to notice is this great contrast between the ruthless, wicked, wealthy, 
high priest Caiaphas with his fabulous mansion and the evil plotting of he and the other religious leaders to kill God's son over and against this humble home of an afflicted but now cured common Jew of Yeshua's unconcern of being near this former outcast the hospitality that this family offers to Jesus and his disciples during the festival period. And then, of course, this lower-class woman using what must have been her prized possession, maybe an inheritance, to anoint God's son, Yeshua. Now, how might she have come by such an expensive perfume? We're not told because it's not relevant to the story. At least it wasn't relevant to Matthew. It seems Yeshua was dining with the family when quite unexpectedly, this unnamed woman produces this expensive ointment, moron in Greek, and walks up behind him, pours it on his head. This expensive stuff is not something a woman would pour onto herself, she'd carefully dab it, making it last as long as possible. But for her, this holy man eating at her table is somehow worth more than her most prized possession, and so gives it all to him by literally dumping it on his head as he eats. And I want to pause for just a moment to remind you of something. She is in no way thinking to herself, this is God's son. This is the Messiah. See, these sorts of details have so far been limited to the knowledge of Yeshua's 12 disciples. We're told this regularly. To my mind, I am most curious as to why she did this somewhat shocking act. You know, it's a common thought in Christianity that she was anointing Jesus for his death just as he was anointed to begin his ministry. Another thought is she's anointing him as a king. I think we can also guess that perhaps she was simply overcome by this famous man who sat at her table. So what was your reason? Now, although Yeshua will supply a definite reason why this was done as a symbolic act of his traditional Jewish burial preparation, I think it is much more likely she didn't have a clue why she did it. No clue. I want to share with you a personal anecdote that may lend some insight into her action. You know, starting when we were children, we, at least I, among my brothers, might do something. Strange that might seem to all of you. And we'd get in trouble for it. And of course, my mother would ask, why would you do such a thing? Now, sometimes I could offer a pretty ready excuse. Other times, I was as puzzled by by my own behavior, she was. I don't know, I'd say. Most of the time, it was the truth. I didn't know. I just did it. You know, I think even as adults, the later adult life, there are things we do that defies what we have ever normally done or what any typical person might do. I don't mean this is necessarily bad or unwise things, but rather things that are out of the ordinary for us. I want to give you a real-life example that, truthfully, I cannot fully fathom. Not long ago, I received an unsolicited email from someone. I get quite a few of these. It had Chinese language characters all over it. So I immediately was suspicious. And against my better judgment, I opened it anyway, 
something I'm not in the habit of doing. I can't tell you why I didn't just instantly delete it. Attached was a CV, a resume, along with a note. And the note said the sender lived in China, like I didn't know that. And as I read the CV, it was this impressive list of education, experiences, achievements in the world of IT and digital communications. And he said he had been following Torah class for some time in China. He could speak English. And that if he could do anything for the ministry, he'd like to. Now, I get these sorts of emails from time to time. And I usually don't pursue them because of their uncertain source. But uncharacteristically for me, I responded. And after a couple of intriguing emails back and forth, he suggested we have a Zoom meeting. Now, it was an interesting meeting to say the least, but my natural skepticism remained. So I contacted a person I know in Israel, sent him the resume and the note to look it over. His reply, it's too good to be true. I thought, yep, that's what I thought too. Still, I said, how about I go ahead and schedule another Zoom meeting with this fellow? I'm going to include my friend in Israel and give him a chance to interrogate this man, see if he could crack the code. Well, the meeting lasted an hour. And if just minutes after the meeting, my friend emailed me, I think he's for real. And after pondering this for a few days, I contacted this man again. And after speaking to him with for just a few minutes, I said, gee, I sure wish there was a way we could get together in person. I'm kind of old school about these sorts of things. He said we could. I was a little taken back since he was in China. Well, it turned out, after our first couple of communications, he was no longer in China. Now he's in a city not far from our facilities, having traveled here just a couple of days earlier. We meet. He tells me he'd like to do this amazing technology work for us to be able to help, uh, for him to be able to help get Torah class into China in a form that could aid the millions of Chinese Christians there with understanding God's word from a Hebrew heritage faith perspective. And this help included translating the hundreds of Torah class transcripts to Mandarin. He says that he and his non-English speaking wife, both believers, simply took a leap of faith, packed a couple of suitcases, put their lives and his career in China on hold, flew to the USA from Shanghai, not knowing if this was simply his own religious zeal driving him to do this, or if it was the Lord directing him, or if it was something I would even consider pursuing. So I asked him why he did this. He said, truthfully, I don't really know. I don't know. Then he followed up by explaining he just, he just had this strong inner urge, this feeling that would not leave him alone, that the Lord wanted him to go to the USA without having any idea what, if anything, might come from it. Well, in the end, I was so taken by his candor that I managed to find a little bit of budget to hire him for just a fraction of what he'd been earning back home. And while I can't really talk about it just yet, we are well down the road to launching something pretty big concerning the distribution of Torah class lessons on a true worldwide basis, including into China. Something which will allow us to reach areas of our planet in ways that were until now impossible for us. This faithful Chinese man could not explain where this thought came from, or why he took such a risk. I think is with this humble and obedient man from China, this humble and obedient woman in Bethany, 
did something that only, only moments earlier she could not have imagined herself doing. If asked afterward why she did this amazing act of pouring such expensive perfume onto Yeshua's surprised head, I kind of imagine she would have said, I don't know. I don't know. It's just something I knew I was supposed to do. And that, my friends, is how it often goes when our God intends to do His will through us without us having a clue about what's going on. Yet we move forward, even taking risks in faith. Now, naturally, since this perfumed ointment pouring event was only between this woman and Yeshua, none of the other people in the room felt that same divine impulse, nor could they fathom why anyone would do such a seemingly irrational thing, which on the surface appeared as rather senseless and, and, and luxuriously wasteful. So Christ's disciples' instant reaction was to be incredulous. Most of them were poor fishermen who daily struggled just to provide for their families. And they just witnessed a woman suddenly dump a lot of money's worth of perfume on their master's head. Now, being men, I'm certain they thought, yep, leave it to a female to do something impulsive like that based on what was only likely an emotional outburst. It did not impress them. It infuriated them. Why waste something so valuable like this, they thought. And since they and Jesus had a natural concern for their truly poverty-stricken brethren, all they could think of was that if she was bound to determine to do something good with this valuable ointment, then she should have given it to them. They could sell it and assist many poor people with those funds. But now it's gone. It's gone. And the only good it did was to make Yeshua smell nice and the woman feel good. But Christ knew exactly why she did it, even though she nor anyone else did. Matthew 26, 10 through 12. Why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you'll not always have me. She poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. See, this breathtaking symbolic act was done without her understanding why she did it. But there is also no reason for us to criticize the disciples. Because you know what? If we were standing there in that home, we too likely would have been astonished, and I don't mean in a good way. There's really no reason to think they should have understood. This good work by this woman can only truly be deciphered in retrospect. No one in that house could foresee what is about to happen over the next couple of days as Yeshua gives up his life for sinful humanity. And I can't imagine that Christ telling his disciples not to get so upset because the poor are always going to be around anyway, which of course is true. I don't think that would have settled very well. See, the statement, of course, wasn't to dismiss the poor but probably was meant to say there will always be innumerable and ongoing opportunities to serve the poor. But Jesus, their Lord and Master, will only be here to serve for a few more precious hours. In fact, Yeshua says that instead of her strange act becoming something that goes unknown, in later times, as everything eventually does with the vapor of life, wherever the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is preached well into the future, 
This is a story that will be heard and loved and remembered by all. And I think we'll close for today and continue when we meet next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.